Hey guys, it's Ryan. Uh, this video we're going to continue to talk about oral pathology and we will move right along continuing to talk about mucosal lesions but this time focusing on infectious disease. So oral infections are either viral, bacterial, or fungal in nature and we'll talk about each of those subcategories in a few seconds. So we'll start with the viruses. Um, there's herpes, simplex virus, which tends to cause mucosal ulcerations preceded by vesicles. We have human papillomavirus, which induces uh, verrucoform sort of warty lesions. And we have Epstein-Barr virus, which causes a white lesion uh, known as oral hairy leukoplakia. So that's our outline. Let's go through them in a little bit more detail. So let's start with herpes simplex virus. Um, and you can call it HSV for short. Uh, I have these terms in red because they're very important to distinguish the type of infection that you're getting from the herpes virus. The primary herpes simplex virus infection would be if you're getting it for the very first time. Uh, this sort of a condition can occur panorally, which means that it can occur anywhere in and around the mouth. Um, it's self-limiting, which means it will go away uh, after a certain amount of time on its own, and it occurs mostly in childhood. Treatment for a primary herpes infection would be palliative, focused on trying to calm the symptoms with uh, rinses that help with the pain, because this is a very painful condition. After the primary infection, the virus never leaves the body, it actually just stays latent or dormant in the trigeminal ganglion. Now that infection can return, and that's when you get a recurrent herpes simplex virus. It could be uh, triggered, and I actually have it written here, reactivation can be triggered by stress, sunlight, or immunosuppression, to name a few. When this infection um, comes back and the herpes virus rears its ugly head, the recurrent infection looks a lot different from the primary infection. So we have actually uh, many different uh, manifestations. One of the most common is herpes labialis, which can also be called recurrent extraoral herpes, uh, commonly called a cold sore or fever blister. This classically appears on the vermilion border between the skin of the face and skin of the lip. Now we also have recurrent intraoral herpes on the other side, and this occurs exclusively on um, attached gingiva, mostly um, or attached mucosa, and it can be attached gingiva or the hard palate. Um, and note that the primary infections are panoral, P and P, whereas the recurrent infections are only on keratinized tissue, like I mentioned the vermilion border, the attached gingiva, and the hard palate. So that's a very important and very commonly tested distinguish, distinguishing factor between those two. Uh, some other uh, manifestations of herpes are herpetic whitlow, which uh, are basically um, these lesions that are occurring on the finger, and a dentist should not contact patients until this lesion resides. Herpes gladi gladiatorum appears on the head classically, on wrestlers, um, and there, there are many, many other manifestations, but that's just a few common ones. And treatment for this would be an antiviral, like a cyclovir, during the prodromal period, before the um, lesion uh, comes on in full force. Next we have varicella zoster virus, which is technically another type of herpes virus. Um, it ha also has several different manifestations. Um, if we talk about the primary infection, our first time we get this virus, it's called varicella, and it can also be called chickenpox, which is uh, very, very common, also self-limiting, and also in childhood. You can kind of see some common threads between these primary infections. And then again, it lays dormant in the trigeminal ganglion. And if it is reactivated by any of the same things we mentioned in the last slide, stress, uh, sunlight, immunosuppression, it can rear its head as a recurrent infection. And this would be known as herpes zoster, or more commonly, shingles. 
and you can kind of see where this virus gets its name, or at least shares its name, with the two manifestations it has, the primary infection, varicella, and the recurrent infection, zoster. And here we have another syndrome. And like I said in the previous videos with oral path, I always list them out like math equations. Ramsey-Hunt syndrome comes up on a lot of um, test questions. It's a herpes zoster reactivation in the geniculate ganglion affecting cranial nerves 7 and 8. And if you remember, 7 um, is the facial nerve, which um, innervates the facial muscles, and then 8 is the vestibulo-cochlear ner uh, vestibulo nerve, and that has to control um, hearing and balance. And so you can see, if you remember seven and eight, you can see how facial paralysis, vertigo with your balance and deafness with your hearing, all sort of correlate pretty well with the cranial nerves that this um, virus is affecting. Again, treatment with acyclovir is common. The Coxsackie virus is not a herpes virus, although um, it may almost sound like it is. It's not the herpes virus. This can result in hand, foot, and mouth disease, which um, you know easily enough affects the hand, the feet, and the mouth. And it could also be um, causing herpangina, which is um, affecting the posterior oral cavity, namely the soft palate, throat, and the tonsils, which are um, sort of part of this Waldire's ring, if you recall this area in the back of the throat. That's where the herpangina um, disease would manifest, both of which are caused by Coxsackie. The next one is measles, measles also referred to as rubiola. And this one, really the most important thing to know is this coplic spots. This is another super, super common thing that comes up. And it's these little dots on the buccal mucosa, little red dots you can kind of make out here. And this would precede the classical skin rash that you that you get with measles. Because um, we're talking about virus, we have um, primary infection here. Again, self-limiting and mostly affecting children. So you can see yet another common thread through all of these different viruses. Next we have papilloma, um, or more commonly referred to as a wart. Um, this papilloma is on the dorsum of the tongue here, and you can kind of see this warty, um, bumpy appearance here. Uh, very, very, um, just very, very pathognomonic of an HPV infection. So the papillomas can be caused by several different strains of HPV. There, I feel like there have to be like hundreds of them. Um, and it's a benign epithelial pedunculated or sessile, which means sort of like um, ballooning out or sessile is more like a mound-shaped, dome-shaped um, lesion. Proliferation on skin or mucosa. So let's talk a little bit more about papillomas. We have uh, Veruca vulgaris which again is caused by several different strains of HPV. I honestly can't quite remember if it's 2, 4, or 40, or something like that. Just many different kinds. And this is a common skin wart. It can also appear um, anywhere. Uh, skin, you can auto-inoculate it. So if it's on one finger and you're picking at it, it can appear on another finger through a cut and so on. Condyloma acuminatum is caused specifically now these are important to know. I would definitely know um, this stuff I have in red, HPV 6 and 11. Um, and those are just kind of numbers I guess you have to memorize, unfortunately. Um, it can be um, also in the form of a genital wart or from oral sex with someone with genital warts. So that's kind of how it can spread um, to a mouth scenario. Treatment would be excision. Also note that it has high recurrence. Focal epithelial hyperplasia, FEH, also known as hex disease, is caused by, um, again, I would know these HPV 13 and 32. This one has multiple small dome-shaped warts or sessile warts on the oral mucosa, can be anywhere in the mouth. And this one, you have a uh, treat with excision with excellent prognosis. So just kind of think of the whole mouth going to heck, so to speak. 
and we talked about this before, oral hairy leukoplakia. Always think this is EBV, this is Epstein-Barr virus, and just always link those two things together. Um, it's a white patch on the lateral tongue that does not wipe off. Um, it's an opportunistic infection, usually associated with HIV and the immunosuppression that results from that. Also associated with Burkitt's lymphoma. Next, um, we have syphilis. So now we're going to start talking about bacterial infections. Bacterial infections are generally uncommon in oral mucosa, and that's mostly because of the protective effects of saliva. So syphilis is caused by contact with Treponema pallidum, which is a spirochete bacteria. So this is a name that I would just drill into your head. This is a really important thing to know. Um, there are three types of lesions. So before we were talking about primary infections with virus, recurrent infections with virus. Now we're transitioning to um, primary and secondary, and even in some cases, tertiary lesions. So syphilis is actually a pretty nice one to learn because these things just come up all over uh, boards, exams, and things like that. So knowing these three, the primary lesion being a, a chancre, um, a secondary lesion being um, sometimes referred to as oral mucus patch, conolomalatum, or maculopapular rash, those definitely learn that, and also tertiary lesion being a guma, and also having um, central nervous system and cardiovascular involvement. So more of a systemic sort of um, effect at this point as being a tertiary lesion. Now congenital syphilis, I kind of listed it like a syndrome. It's not technically a syndrome, but congenital syphilis, you see this Hutchinson's triad, which um, includes notched incisors, which I picked, pictured here, um, and mulberry molars. So um, those two things are, affect the teeth, deafness affecting the ears, and ocular keratitis affecting the eyes. So the triad referring to teeth, eyes, and ears being affected by um, a baby who is born by a mother with syphilis. And that's pretty rare, but can occur. Next, we have tuberculosis. And this is caused by inhalation of mycobacterium tuberculosis. So that makes sense. Um, and remember, syphilis was contact. Now we're talking about inhalation. So tuberculosis is characterized by oral non-healing chronic ulcers following lung infection. And again, we have primary, secondary, this time miliary instead of tertiary infections with TB. So primary, and, and I should say TB is actually very confusing. It has a very convoluted way of working and manifesting in the body, but I'm just trying to keep it really nice and simple and focus on, again, the highest yield kind of stuff that you need to know. So primary infection involves this gone complex. And I have it in this um, chest x-ray here, which is a pretty cool picture. And the gone complex involves inhaled bacteria surrounded in a granuloma, which is granulation tissue, um, think macrophages, that undergoes caseating necrosis and an infected hilar lymph node draining the first lesion. So that's a lot of fancy words. What do I mean by that? So the hilum is referring to the root of the lung. So you can Imagine if this is our lung with all the air here, this is about where the hilum would be, the root where it connects to um, the bronchi and the, and the bronchioles and all that in the center towards the spine. So the hilar lymph nodes are located right close to this root of the lung. So you can imagine this red um, circle here is, is encircling this um, granuloma that's um, maybe calcified a little bit while it's appearing a little more radiopaque and surrounded all these um, mycobacterium. It's, it's controlling the infection um, and it's undergoing um, death in the center of this, um, this infection. And now we're having the bacteria being drained to this nearby lymph node and that's also undergoing this um, same sort of process of um, calcification why it's appearing on the x-ray. So this is our primary TB infection with the gone complex um, associated with both of these together. 
Secondary infection just becomes more widespread with some cavitation in the miliary, um, like the tertiary uh, infection that we talked about with syphilis, becomes more systemic and a little bit more serious and dangerous. Now, HIV patients are at high risk of getting progressive disease, and treatment of TB involves multi-drug therapy, isoniazid, rifampin, ethambutol, and, and so on. Um, gonorrhea, um, just to note, is caused by this Neisseria gonorrhea, and oral pharyngitis or any sort of oral manifestation is rarely seen. But just know that this is caused by this bacteria. Actinomycosis is caused by Actinomyces israelii, and this is a filamentous bacteria. It's not a fungi. It definitely sounds like this Actinomyces. You think, oh, that, that sounds like a classic fungi name. It's it's a really it's um, really a trap answer there if that's asked on um, an exam. Actinomycosis is bacterial, not fungal. Um, it's an opportunistic infection. It's chronic and granulomatous, uh, meaning again it's it's involving granulomas, and it has two main types, which make a whole lot of sense. Sense, which is nice. Um, periapical actinomycosis. Um, is a jaw infection, as seen in the picture below, where cervicofacial affects the head and the neck. So those are the two classic types. And the most important characteristic of this infection is that there's sulfur granules in this really messy, icky, purulent exudate, so basically pus with sulfur granules. And treatment is long-term, high-dose, penicillin, which is our classic antibiotic. Next we have scarlet fever caused by group A strep, which um, I like to think of as streptococcus pyogenes as being the um, classical group A strep. This is when strep throat basically becomes a systemic infection and classic oral mucosal lesion is strawberry tongue, which is this white coated tongue with red inflamed Fungiform papillae, and I would know that specifically fungiform because test makers like to test. You know, we we're talking about hairy tongue in the in the last video being elongated filiform papillae, and now this one's affecting fungiform papillae. So that's a um, a cool thing to get to know and um, be familiar with that kind of stuff. Treatment again, we're bacterial, so we want an antibiotic. Penicillin is the go-to. Alrighty, and last we'll talk about fungi. So most bacterial and fungal infections manifest as chronic ulcers. Um, in Canada, which is by far the most common, can cause either white or red lesions, as we'll see in just a moment. So candidiasis is also known as thrush or oral thrush, as we're talking about it with regards to the mouth. Um, pseudomembranous is one of the types, and it's a white plaque that rubs off. So if you remember, back to oral hairy leukoplakia, we talked about a white plaque on the lateral tongue that doesn't rub off, but this one um, does. So that's a really, really important distinction there. Atrophic candidiasis is red, um, and this can often be the result of a poorly fitting denture or a denture that's not being cleaned regularly. Uh, median rhomboid glossitis is loss of lingual papillae, um, and that's what this picture is showing down here. It's sort of like this bald, flat spot on the tongue. And angular chelitis is um, infection inflammation in the corners of the mouth. And treatment would be, in, now that we're talking about fungi and antifungal, like um, an azole, um, like fluconazole or a statin like nystatin. And lastly, we have deep fungal infections. So this one, I just um, went ahead and listed the kind of um, most, uh, the most characteristic spots where you'd find these deep fungal infections. Uh, most of these uh, fungi are present in soil, uh, and blastomycosis would be in the U.S. Northeast, and they're involved in um, involved with inhalation of spores, usually like after a big rain or something. 
um, cochidiodomycosis, that's a tough one to pronounce, is um, in the U.S. Southwest and also known as valley fever, uh, cryptococcosis in the U.S. West, and histoplasmosis in the U.S. Midwest, like the Ohio and Mississippi River Valleys. All these are relatively rare um, and pretty destructive um, if they really um, do some damage. And I think that's it for this video. So please like this video and consider subscribing to my channel if you haven't already for more oral pathology and other things dentistry. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you all in the next video.